It's uh, really wonderful to be together this afternoon, and it is, it is a privilege. We, we are now going to hear from the true and living God as he speaks to us through uh, these wonderful verses uh, in chapter, end of chapter 5 and chapter 6 in Joshua. Um, we're finishing off just a, a short, what's been a short holiday series in Joshua, and uh, we're going to be closing off um, our chapters in Romans. We're going back to Romans from next week, but I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll jump into this great chapter. Let's pray. You are the victorious, true, and living God. And so we bring our hearts and minds before you now. Father, there are loads of things that we might believe about you that are wrong. We ask you to correct us today. Uh, There are loads of things that we, uh, we think too small of you. And we ask you to correct that in us today. Lift our eyes to you, the victorious one, by the power of your spirit. Help us to understand this chapter and what it means for us now in 2022 so we can live out our lives in devotion to you, the true and living God. Amen. So our passage today is like a classic action movie, uh, action-adventure movie. There's this, there's this massive battle um, and it actually really takes place, the, the, the battle that's recorded for us is actually very short. It's, I think it's only three verses in, in the, the whole chapter, uh, this destruction of Jericho. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of backstory that is, that is told to us. And, and I think the reason for that is because the battle isn't the focus. Even though we'll, we'll get to it, we'll think about the battle a little bit later. But the author, Joshua, the author of Joshua wants to teach us some important truths lead up to this battle. And the overarching lesson that we're going to be seeing is that God is victorious. So that's what we're going to be thinking about today. God is victorious. Keep that in the, the top of your mind. There it is on the, on the screen for you to see. God is victorious. And I think that's why the battle is recorded for us in such a sort of brief way. Because Jericho didn't have a chance. They didn't have a chance. Standing before this God, no chance. It falls. This is the Lord we're talking about. The God who made promises to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12 and chapter 15 about how he would raise up a nation for himself. That would be his people. He would be their God. And he would give the land of Canaan to live in. And that's where Jericho is. Jericho sits in the land of Canaan. And since God made those promises way back to, to Aram. He's been systematically fulfilling them. And keep cutting out. Move here. So this is the Lord. This is the God who's made wonderful promises uh, to, to Abraham and one who he has been systematically answering those things. He's grown Israel from just Abraham's family to this, this mighty nation. He's rescued them out of the hands of the Egyptians. So you know the great Exodus story by sending... Ten plagues, obliterates Egypt. Um, he, he carries the Israelites through the Red Sea, parts the sea. There they walk through out on dry land. We see how he provides water for the Israelites as they are thirsty in the desert. And uh, he does that in some incredible ways out of a rock at one point as Moses hits a rock. He gives manna from heaven for them to feast on. So he provides for them in such a wonderful way. He leads them to the borders of the promised land, and now they're in it. They finally got there. God has brought them to where he said he would, but there are people in the way. There are other nations who occupy this land, and the first nation that the Israelites encounter are those living in Jericho, a great and mighty city. And our section starts, I wanted to to start in chapter 5, because there's a bit of backstory here. Our section starts with Joshua, and he's marching uh, with the Israelites on the way through to Jericho. But before they get there, they meet somebody who's standing in the way. Have a look at chapter 5, verse 13. If you've got a Bible open, you can have a look at it. It should be up on the screen. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up, and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua approached him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? He asks what I think is a pretty good question, right? Whose side are you on? Are you with us or are you with with the enemies? But did you notice the strange answer in verse 14? The man replies, neither. 
or the ESV translation just translated as no. It just says no. It doesn't even answer the question, really. Um, it, seems, it seems Joshua has asked the wrong thing. Perhaps, perhaps he should have asked, who are you? Because that is what the man goes on to answer. Instead, have a look at verse 14, the rest of verse 14. He says, no, neither, he replied. I have now come as commander of the Lord's army. Then Joshua bowed his face to the ground in homage and asked him, what does my Lord want to say to his servant? The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, remove the sandals from your feet. for The place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did that. Here, standing before Joshua, is this commander of the Lord's army. Now, who that is, we have no idea, other than he's the commander of the Lord's army. Some have suggested that this is an angel. Some have suggested that this is a sort of a pre-incarnate Jesus standing before Joshua. We're not sure. But notice what he says. He speaks the word of God to Joshua. And do you notice he repeats what God had said to Moses Uh, through the burning bush, commissioning him to go to Pharaoh all those years ago. And so here, as Israel enter the land of Canaan, God is making plain to Joshua who is in charge, who is the one sending him into this land. Here's the first point we want to think about. God doesn't choose sides. God doesn't choose sides. Now, we know as we come to the story that God is indeed on the side of the Israelites. They are his people. However, it is God who is the playmaker. God is the one who calls the shots. God is the one leading the way, not Joshua. See, it would have been very tempting for the people to look to Joshua as their leader, and rightly so. He is their leader under God. But to forget that it was God who was the one who was fighting the battles for them and the one who was ultimately leading them. It too would have been very tempting for Joshua, and we saw a little bit of this last week, for for Joshua and and the, the, the elders of Israel, as they planned and strategized, to think that it was in their strength or their wisdom that he could save the day, or they could save themselves. And that, you know, because God is their God, he will fall in line and just bless what they are doing as if he's some kind of lucky charm to the Israelites, or they had God in, in their pockets because they are his people, so he'll just listen to them and do whatever they wanted. But that's not the case. God doesn't fit into anybody's plan. No, he is working out his plans. And Israel is to follow him. He is the one who is in charge. He stands over them. Whose side are you on? Neither. Neither. And I think we need to be reminded of this because as Christians, I know this is true of my heart, I can easily slip into the same sort of attitude that I am the playmaker, that I am the the victor of my soul. I am the one who takes charge. I am my own savior. And God becomes a means to answer my wishes, or let's be frank, often my demands of what I want. That he is at my beck and call and he's just there to rub a stamp the decisions I make and what I want. James chapter four, verse 13. James writes, come now, you who say today or tomorrow will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. Yet, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. You do not know. You do not know what your life will be. For you are like vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Instead, you should say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. See, God is the one who's in control of our tomorrows, not us. We live our lives knowing that God is working out his plans and his purposes, and yet we forget it so quickly. And we we try and rip the reins out out of his hands. And we see this very clearly reflected in the way we pray. How often God is just my enabler. And instead of praying, as Rubert prayed a little bit earlier, your kingdom come, I often only ask for the things that I want or the things that I need for the plans that I've set in place. Instead of following Jesus' example of how to pray, your will be done. Now, it's not that we don't make plans and it's not that we, we don't make decisions and God will just drop plans 
and decisions into our, into our laps, but we do strive to make decisions according to the will of our sovereign, almighty God. Are we seeking to obey him and bend our wills and our plans around his mission? You see, he has a plan. He does have a plan, and he is working it out, and we'll be thinking that about more of that in a moment. But we are called to follow and live our lives in light of his good plan that he is working out. And so decisions from big to small, we want to be thinking about how we follow after our God, where we live, how we live, how, how we work, how, how you parent, how you spend your money, how you spend your time. These are all important things to be shaped around the very will and plans and purposes of God. We've just seen in Romans chapter 12 in our series this, uh, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, I urge you to do what? Not do your own thing. I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed. Don't be bent around what the world is doing. Conform to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. See, God doesn't fit into our lives. We revolve around him and his mission, which is to make disciples as he leads us, like Israel, to our promised land of heaven, eternal life. And how I pray that today our wills and our plans if they're not already, that God would turn up the heat and slowly bend our wills around his as we renew our minds and come to him for wisdom, come, for, come to him for discernment, to understand his will and what it looks like in the different circumstances that we all find ourselves in today. And a spoiler alert, Monday, I'm allowed to give a little, a little thing about next year. Plan, we started a plan for what we're going to be doing next year. In 2023, we're embarking on a year of seeking wisdom from God, Lis- learning to listen to him and to live wisely in the world that he has made. And so if you're, if you're feeling desperate for wisdom and wanting to understand what is God's will, what is he doing, what is his plan, January, we kick off our year in the book of Ecclesiastes and the Proverbs in our growth groups. But God doesn't choose sides. We need to know that. He is the Almighty. He is God. Here's the second thing that we learn. God is the one, because he's victorious, God is the one who will have to bring victory in Jericho. We get to chapter six now. This is the chapter all about the battle. Verse one. Now Jericho was strongly fortified because of the Israelites. No one was leaving. No one was entering. So the city's on lockdown. We all hate that word. But the city was on lockdown, right? No one's going in, no one's going out. And in order to understand the significance of verse one, we need to know what Jericho was like. It was a great fortified city with walls that were over 12 meters thick. Uh, And it's believed that people used to live in the walls. They actually had their their homes within the walls of the city. That's how big they were. Uh, Walls that were over 30 meters high. So that's what? Double this hall, maybe a bit more. Humanly speaking, it was impossible for Israel, this group of wanderers who've just come out of Egypt, to defeat this Jericho. It was built to withstand the most well-equipped armies. You have a look at verse 2. What does the Lord say? He says, look, I have handed Jericho, its king and its best soldiers, over to you. The only way for Israel to get anywhere anywhere close, anywhere close to victory was for God to bring the walls down. He had to do it. And I wonder if you noticed in the reading, he does it in a very strange way. It's a very, it's, it's a very odd chapter. The Israelites are to walk around the city. That is the army, followed by seven priests who are blowing trumpets, or in the, the version on the screen was ram's horns. That was then followed by the Ark of the Covenant. And then there was a rear guard behind the Ark. The people were to be quiet and not to say a thing. The only noise to be heard was the trumpets. They were to do this for six days. Get up, wake up, eat breakfast, pack up camp, walk around, come back, eat dinner. That was the, for six days, that's what they did. And then on the seventh day, they had to walk around the city 
seven times, that's 13 in total, and then when a long trumpet blast was sounded, they were to shout and the walls would come down. It's such an odd way that God would choose to bring the walls down, but I think it shows pretty clearly that it was God who did it. God was the one who had to do it. Israel did nothing, really. I mean, yes, they walked around a couple of times. Yes, they had a bit of a shout at one point, okay? But God is ultimately the one who does it. And that's, I think, why the ark is spoken of so much. I think, it's, I think it's mentioned 10 times in the first 14 verses. The ark of God was symbolic of God's presence being with the people of Israel. And so the author is trying to show us that God was with the Israelites and he is the one who is outworking this plan. And as verse two says, to give Jericho over to the Israelites. He hands them the city on a platter. The Israelites have no hope of, de- of, of defeating Jericho. And so they needed to trust God as they were walking around. They needed to trust that God would do what he had promised to do, even if it sounded unbelievable. And put yourself in the shoes of the Israelites for a moment. Imagine that's what you had to do. Get up, walk around the city. They're doing everything but attack. I mean, how, how are they going to get in by just walking around? And especially just walking in silence as well. They've just got a couple of vuvuzelas, you know, like, you know but they had to trust that God would do what he said he would do. He's the one who's going to bring victory. And it's all because he is gracious. Not because Israel are worthy somehow of this victory or receiving this land that's being given to them. It's all his grace. As they enter, God wants to show them that he is the reason they have what they have. Not because they deserved it or have earned it. And once again, I think that's something that we need to be reminded of very clearly we need to remember that as we continue in this life as we as we walk as we journey on our way to the promised land of heaven God is the one who brings about victory we need to know that God is the one who has saved us through his work on the cross Jesus coming and dying and like walking around the city walls God coming as a man to hang on a cross to bear our sin and to promise us eternal life is unconventional, right? In fact, Paul tells us that the cross seems foolish to the world, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, the power of God. Like the walls around Jericho, there are no way, there's no way that we could deal with the high walls that our, silt, or that our sin had built up. We were outside of the blessing of God. We were excluded from hope and life and made ourselves enemies of this victorious one. But Jesus comes into the world. Jesus comes to break the walls down. You'll remember as Jesus died, the curtain in the temple is torn in two. We can now draw near to this victorious God. And he has broken down the dividing wall of hostility amongst people that he is gathering together. He's building his church. That is his will. That is his mission. That is what he is doing in the world. And that is the plan that we are to bend our lives around. And like with Jericho, he hands us forgiveness and hope and the church and eternal life on a platter. He gives it to you and me. It's ours through nothing more than placing our lives in the hands of this victorious God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 30 says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. The people needed to trust that God would win the battle for them. So do we. We need to trust that God is winning the battle. He's won at the cross. Jesus won at the cross. And he will win ultimately one day when he comes and brings his new kingdom. And so we look to him in faith. Thirdly, God Bringing victory doesn't mean that Israel can now just do whatever they want, as I said earlier. If this is the victorious God, they needed to listen to him. They need to obey him. Notice uh, verse 16, the people are ordered to shout on that seventh day. And you're almost in one sense, because you kind of know what's going to happen, you're expecting the walls to crumble down as they shout. But just before they're about to shout, 
the author kind of interrupts from verse 17, and Joshua has a little kind of a little sermon ready for a couple of verses. Have a look at verse 16 through 20. After the seventh, the seventh time, the priest blew the ram's horn, and Joshua said to the troops, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. But, here comes a little talk, but the city and everything in it are set apart for the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and everyone with her in the house will live, because she hid the messengers we sent. But keep yourselves from the things set apart, or you'll be set apart for destruction. If you take any of those things, you'll be set apart the camp of Israel for destruction and make trouble for it. For all the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are dedicated to the Lord and must go into the Lord's treasury. And back to the story. So the troops shouted and the ram's horn sounded. When they heard the blast of the ram's horn, the troops gave a great shout and the walls collapsed. The troops advanced into the city, each man straight ahead, and they captured the city. So what do we learn? In light of this victory that is given to them, Israel are to listen. They are to do what this sovereign God says. They need to listen and obey. Not to earn the victory. God has given them the victory. But in light of the victory. And that's a very big difference. Seems similar, but it's not. There are conditions to receiving this victory. They are to devote the entire city, apart from the gold and silver, to destruction. And so Israel are called to have faith in God for the victory and then to live in line with that faith. That was ominous. Yeah. (laughs) And it's absolutely key that we grasp this because the same is true for us. As Christians, we are called to live lives of faith, meaning we are to live in line with God's word. Christian seeks to be uh, obedient to God in light of the victory that God has won in and through Christ. To quote James again, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. The Israelites, in the midst of success that God was bringing them, needed to be reminded of that before these walls come crashing down. And for the Christian, it's the same. We are to live our lives not our own way, but God's way. He demands, he demands obedience. Now, we don't devote cities to destruction like Israel do here. We saw last week that the only demolishing we do is arguments. We speak the truth about God to a world that has suppressed the truth, truth that we used to suppress when we weren't trusting in Christ. And as Jesus challenges us, we don't execute opponents, we execute sin in us. We put to death the old and we put on obedience and devote ourselves to doing what is good and what is right. And so friends, this week, as God's people who have been rescued by Jesus, devote yourselves to what is good. Devote yourselves to what is right. It won't always be easy, but cherish what is right in the eyes of your Lord, your victorious God, and devote yourselves to him. Okay, still with me. Last point. And briefly, God is faithful in judgment and salvation. These um, final few verses are not easy reading. Okay, verse 21, have a look. Israel charge in. They completely destroyed everything in the city with a sword. Every man and woman, both young and old, and every ox, sheep, and donkey. So God here orders the systematic destruction of everyone in the city. You notice there, men, women, young, old, all life is destroyed. So whether you've been a Christian for a long time or whether you're new to Christianity, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't struggle with verse 21. It's, it, these, are, these are difficult things. They're hard words. But I want you to have a look at Deuteronomy chapter 9 because this helps us understand what's going on here in Jericho. Chapter 9, verse 4 and 5 When the Lord your God drives them, that's these are the Canaanites out of the land. When when the Lord your God drives them out before you, do not say to yourself, the Lord brought me in to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. Remember, it's God's grace, not because of the Israelites. Always God's grace. Instead, the Lord will drive out these nations before you. Why? 
because of their wickedness. You are not going to take possession of the land. He restates it twice so that we get the point. You are not going to take the possession of this land because of your righteousness or your integrity. Instead, the Lord your God will drive out these nations before you because of their wickedness. What is God doing here in this event of Jericho? He's punishing those who are wicked. And it is good and right that he does. And friends, this is one of the arguments that we as Christians will need to demolish. A falsehood believed by so many that God is love, which he is, but then so many believe that because God is love, he can't judge. He can't be a judge in God. No, that's not true. He does. And it's not because he's not loving that he judges. It's because he is a God of love that he judges. He must do it. The world has run away from him. The world is a wicked place. And justice needs to be seen and meted out. And God will do it. God will dispense it, whether we like it or whether we don't. And he does it here to those in Jericho. And friends, that should make us open our ears and sit upright and listen. God will take down and destroy those who oppose him. But I wonder if you notice also in light of this destruction in the city, there's a glimmer of hope in all of this. Because just like God is faithful in judgment, he's also wonderfully faithful in salvation. Have a look at verse 22 and 23. Joshua said to the two men who had scouted the land, go to the prostitute's house and bring the woman out of there and all who are with her just as you swore to her. So that happened in Joshua chapter 2. So the young men went in who had scouted and brought out Rahab and her father, mother, brothers, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her whole family and settled them outside the camp of Israel, probably because they were unclean for a time, so they would be camping outside. They burned the city and everything in it, and they put the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. However, Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute and her father's family and all who belonged to her, Because she hid the messengers Joshua had sent to spy on Jericho, and she still lives in Israel today. Rahab. Rahab, a prostitute who had heard of the Lord and had been hearing of these stories of what this Lord had been doing to all the enemies of Israel. She feared him and submitted herself to him and his people, protecting the Israelites, the spies who went into Jericho in Joshua chapter 2. And God saved her. God saved her. Isn't that an amazing thing? In light of judgment, there is grace. God saves anyone who places their lives into his hands, even a foreign prostitute. See, the people of Jericho got what they deserved, but Rahab, through trusting in this Lord, this almighty God, turning to him, She got what she didn't deserve. Her life was saved, and her and her family were incorporated into the people of Israel. And here's the crazy thing. A foreign prostitute works her way, or God works her, into the genealogy of Jesus. The God-man who comes to die to show God's grace had in him the DNA of a prostitute from Jericho. And so, yes, God judges those who reject him, but he saves those who turn to him. So if you're a person today who has not turned to this almighty God, turn to him. Turn to him. He is a God who has mercy and will have mercy on you. And if you haven't done that, you need to know that you're in every bit as much trouble as the citizens of Jericho. You, like Rahab, must ask God to have mercy. And you can be even more sure than Rahab was that if you seek mercy, you will find it. And you can have surety of that because Jesus has come. And Jesus died and rose again to be victorious and to promise us this victory. There's forgiveness there. 
So turn to him if you haven't. How should we respond if you are a Christian here this afternoon? Realize, let it sink in again, marvel again at what Jesus endured for you on the cross. He takes all of the wrath of God that should have been ours. He takes it on himself. Be humbled by that, that God would do that for you. Be thankful that he is the victor that you need. And realize that the grace of God is the most important thing in your life. It really is. It really is. Everything else pales in comparison. And if God's mission and plan is to save people and to give them life, then we are to bend our our lives around this mission to help people go from being enemies of God to being forgiven, destined for eternal life. Nothing is more important than that this week. As you go about whatever you're going to go about doing, the mission of God is happening. Bend your life around him. He has called us to speak this good news of a, of a faithful savior who is victorious. And people can escape judgment as they turn to him. Be part of that. That's what he's called us to. You, like Rahab, living in the city, this city, the city will be destroyed one day. Get as many as you can, like Rahab, get as many as you can into your house so that some can be saved. And so may this week count for eternity. May God bless you and others through you as you trust this victorious God and obey him. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the reminder today that you are God. You don't choose sides. And yet, as as a church which has just moved through Romans chapter 8, we're reminded so powerfully that if God is for us, who can be against us? We praise you for Jesus. Thank you that he has washed us clean, forgiven us. He is victorious. My prayer for every single person sitting here today, everyone online who might be tuning in, would have begged for mercy. Thank you that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. But Father, we've also been warned of judgment that you will dispense it. You cannot tolerate sin forever, and you won't. So, Father, we pray for our hearts that this week as we go out into our weeks, whatever they look like, that you would give us an eternal perspective. People need rescue. People need a savior. People need Jesus. And we can speak all about him. And so help us, as we saw last week, to go out and demolish arguments falsehoods against you. May we speak the truth in love this week. And may you grow your church through our little actions and little works. Help us to devote ourselves to you and your plan and your purposes. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.